والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. I pray inshallah all of you are are well in good health and preparing yourselves for the great coming of the great month of Ramadan. Remember, of course, we are still in the great final days of the great month of Sha'aban. This is the month in which the Prophet of Allah said most people are ghafil, are heedless about between Rajab and Ramadan. Therefore, maximize your use and potential in what remains of Sha'aban to really maximize the coming and the great coming of Ramadan. As they say, Rajab is a month of the cultivation and Sha'aban is a month of irrigation and Ramadan is a month of the harvesting. So the expectation, therefore, is for the servants of Allah, that by the time you get to Ramadan, you're in the mode of great worshipping of Allah. Not that Ramadan comes and all of a sudden you're unprepared for that month. Therefore, make as much provision as you can, inshallah, for in these remaining days of Sha'aban. I'm very honored to be in your great company, here, all the way here in Ken over hilly roads and great landscape. And of course, we are reminded, in fact, whenever I think about uh, to my, to my, my, my recent books published, in fact, were connected to landscaping and what we call sites of othering. This in fact connects to uh, discourse of spatial identities and you think about spaces of here, there and elsewhere. So we're coming of course from Slough. Who knows where Slough is? Oh, somebody. Yeah, somebody. <laughs> yeah, and this is quite different. I mean the landscape, the setting, uh, maybe the air is different to that of Slough. And of course we're living in the same country, I understand that. We all are familiar with different landscapes and where our country here in England. Um, but there is a beautiful connection in fact in the Quran before we inshallah we begin, and maybe it's connected in fact to our topic today, about how we transition through space, landscape, through time and space, and what that means for us really as human beings, as Muslims, as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so my point is, in the chapter in the Qur'an called Surah An-Naml, which is called, a chapter called The Ants, in fact, we find this amazing uh, kind of juxtaposing of spaces, but connected to space and meaning. So, uh, in the Qur'an, we have this verse concerning the Prophet Suleiman, Prophet Solomon in the Qur'an. And it says that, gathered before Suleiman were his army of humans and jinn and bird, whom yuza'oon, and they're all assembled and arranged before him. So you think about... Um, a sight of power, of might, of, you know, like kingdom, when you think about that. I mean, that's humans and jinn and birds all in, in submissiveness, really, to Suleiman, the Prophet of Allah. But then comes the next verse where Allah says, Hatta idha ato ala wadin naml, Until they came to the valley of the ants. And a valley is like a lower place. And it's a valley that belongs to another species called ants. You would imagine millions of ants in this valley, and Allah says, namlatun, and the female queen ant spoke and says, Ya yuhan naml, O ants, udkhulu masakinakum, enter your homes. You don't want Suleiman and his army to crush you, and they won't even perceive they're going to be crushing you because you're too small to be recognized. That's the meaning. So the idea is the transition from a place of familiarity, like your home, my home, I know where I live, I know my landmarks, my setting, I feel comfortable when we're leaving from here, in the evening and you see the signpost saying Slough, you think oh, you're, we're almost there. And I'm sure you guys feel the same where we, when you guys reaching back home and you know, I, I, this is where I belong. Where you're connected, your familiarity, your sense of space and place and belonging is there. We don't always live in a place that is a there space, like here, there and elsewhere. Sulaiman so and, his, and, his, and his people, his army, they entered a there space. It's somebody else lives there. And, Others are there and everything's different in, in that valley. But that's not the most important thing as we navigate through space as human beings in that the next verse then says, قال, and then he, Allah says, He says a beautiful prayer. He says, رَبِّ أَوْزِعْنِي أَنْ أَشْكُرَ النِّعْمَتَكَ الَّتِ نَمْتَ عَلَيْ وَعَلَى وَالِدَيْ وَنَعْمَلَ الصَّالِحَ أَنْتَ رَضَّاهُ وَأَدْخِلْنِي بِرَحْمَتِكَ فِي أَبَادِكَ الصَّالِحِينَ What an amazing sense of uh, recon recognition, connection. Amazing sense of heart that's speaking there that Allah says that his prayer was my Lord Inspire me to be grateful to you for what you've blessed me with and blessed my parents with And enable me to do good deeds that you're pleased with and enter me by your mercy amongst your pious righteous servants 
That's the dua and prayer of Suleiman. You, see, you might think of that as, a, as an elsewhere space. But the reality is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always al-qareeb. Allah is always ever near. So we couldn't even call it elsewhere space if Allah is saying Allah is ever near. And Allah in the Quran says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عَبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبِ When my servants ask you concerning me, I am ever near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِي لَعَلَمْ يَرْشِدُونَ So therefore, whoever calls upon me in that state of beseeching and distress, I am ever near. Let him therefore respond to me and believe me, so therefore he will find guidance in that state. But that's not the topic of my discussion today. That's just an intro. Because of the fact that we're navigating through space, and I'm in this new space, and the Quran reminds us a lot about what spaces mean for us. My name is Dr. Uthman Latif. I'm all the way from Slough, as I just said, <laughs> in your great company. I'm very honored to be here. Um, and today's uh, talk, inshallah, is about, it's really about the message of Islam, how Islam reached the world that we live in today. What, was, what were the factors that contributed to the rapid rise of Islam uh, from the beginning, and how is it today? What lessons we can draw on from then till today? And what about the growth of Islam today in the 21st century? Uh, my expertise, in fact, my doctorate was in the Crusades. My PhD was in the Crusades. My first book published, which you might have in your library here, hopefully, is called The Cutting Edge of the Poet Sword, Muslim Poetic Responses to the Crusades. Uh, I then did my postdoctorate in international relations on the field of human empathy in war and conflict and human suffering. That's published, might be in your library here as well, hopefully, called Navigating War, Descent and Empathy in Arab-U.S. Relations, Seeing Our Others in Darkened Spaces. Um, my third book, in fact, was, is called On Being Human, How Islam Addresses Othering, Dehumanization, Empathy. That was launched in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, on the first year anniversary of the terrible massacres in those two mosques in New Zealand. My most recently published book is called Divine Perfection, Christianity and Islam on Sin and Salvation. Major topic, point, uh, in fact, are, you can buy the way the book is free as an e-book also. It's on Amazon, also an e-book, which you can download for free on sapiensinstitute.org website. So I do recommend you guys do that, download that, inshallah, and maybe take benefit from that. Now, uh, I want to begin with a verse in the Quran, and I want you guys to think about this verse. In this verse, Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, man kana maytan fa'ahyaynahu Is he who was dead? And we gave him life. And then we gave him a light. And he walks amongst people with that light. Is that person like the one who is in ghulumat, which is darknesses? And there's no escape from those darknesses. Allah is saying, therefore, is the one who is alive, is the one who has perception, is the one who has purpose, is the one who has that light in life, like the one who has nothingness in life, but darkness and confusion and ambiguity and no drive and no purpose in life, is, are those two people comparable? Allah is asking rhetorically for us. Now when it comes to the great growth of Islam right from the very beginning, following, in fact, in the Prophet's own life, وسلم, I want us to think about four key things, or four or five. One is to do with the imperative injunction of conveying of the message of Islam. Simply put, just what we call da'wah, which is to invite others to the faith of Islam. The other is to do with trade, other to do with migration, intermarriage, and social influences. All of these, in fact, play a role in how Islam reached us today, and in fact, continues to reach other people in our world today as well. Allah in the Qur'an, He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in chapter 16, verse 125, He says, Ud'u ila sabeel rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidati al hasana wa jadilhum bilatihi ahsan. Allah says, invite all people, invite to the way of your Lord, to the way of your Lord, with wisdom and good preaching, and reason and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Indeed, you all know, your Lord knows best who is guided, and your Lord knows best who is led astray or who goes astray. Therefore, a very central verse, therefore. 
about you're a Muslim, right? You're living your life in devotion and submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you cherish and you love the faith that you belong to, right? You find great joy and happiness. And you know this is a true religion. This is the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you want to share that faith with those that you love. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? That whatever you love for yourself, you would love for other people. In fact, the Prophet of Allah said in the hadith, he said, none of you truly believe until you love for others what you love for yourself. So whatever you love for yourself, you would love for others. And the most important, precious thing you love for yourself is what gives you life. And what gives you salvation in the next life. And you would wish that for every person. That's the most important stimulus. So if you think about what motivated those first archetypal, paradigmatic individuals or prophets, companions to travel far afield, to leave their homes and everything else and just travel for the sake of conveying the message of Islam, it was simply that. That I, I'm, I've been blessed with Islam and I want to give this message of Islam to everybody else around me in my world. Convey the message of Islam. The Prophet of Allah in the hadith, بَلِّغْ وَعَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Convey, spread the message even if it's one verse, but preach and convey that one verse. Allah the Quran is telling us many imperatives about, you know, be resolute, be upright, but convey the message. As for the favors of your Lord, then proclaim them, speak, be engaged in your world as an active influencer of moral goodness, of moral character, of truth. That's the imperative of, of Islam. And so we find, therefore, in the Prophet's life, there were many people who the Prophet of Allah himself sent to places of, of, of strangeness, you might say, of places they hadn't visited before, they weren't familiar with. One of those, in fact, we'll talk about is a man called Mu'adh ibn Jabal, عن, in the Prophet's life. The Prophet sends Mu'adh ibn Jabal, this is a young man, like in his early 20s. All right? But he has the prophetic companies, therefore he is trained by the Prophet himself. And the Prophet sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen to call the Christians to Islam, specifically the Christian people to Islam. That was the function. That was the role. Remember, of course, we believe that the last Prophet preceding the Prophet Muhammad was Jesus, the son of Mary. Salam. Right? So this much, therefore, we have in connection with our Christian friends. I was in Ireland just two weeks ago having a discussion, debate thing with Dr. Michael Nazir Ali of the Catholic faith. And the topic, in fact, was on sin and salvation, topic of my book. I just finished writing it when I got the invitation to speak. I was in good, good preparation for, for that talk. It will be on YouTube, inshallah, in the, next, in the next few days. But I hope that comes up in the QA time because I, I'd like to talk about it. I think it's so important because Easter's coming up and Ramadan's coming up. And these two events kind of, you know, are important for our, because they both connect in some ways to salvation, in the salvific models of Christianity and in the salvific model of Islam. So maybe someone be brave enough to ask a question about that at the end, I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, uh, and so therefore, to call the people of Yemen to, to, to Islam, the Christians to Islam, and the Prophet is giving him advice as it's one of the most dramatic hadith. Dramatic narrations, in fact, from the Prophet ﷺ because it's emotional. It's really emotional if you read it. Because it says that Mu'ad ibn Jabal is now leaving Medina. And the Prophet's walking alongside with him. And Mu'ad is leaving. And the Prophet is advising with every step. And the Prophet says to him, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, yassira wa la tu'assira wa, wa, wa bashira wa la tunafira. He says, Mu'ad, make things easy for people. Don't make things laborious and difficult and tough for people. And give the people good news. And don't make them run away from you. And Mu'ad ibn Jubal says that, وَآخِرَ مَا أَوْصَانِي بِهِ And the last advice the Prophet of Allah gave me when I put my foot on the saddle was, وَأَحْسِنْ خُلُقَكْ يَا Mu'ad ibn Jabal And make your character beautiful, O Mu'ad ibn Jabal. See, it can't simply be words that speak. It has to be a heart that is awake, a heart that is engaged, it has to be your limbs, your body, your character, your behavior, your manners should speak as you propagate the beauty of Islam. It's not just words that carry, it's words that should impact the heart because your character is refined. And if your character is refined, that, that speaks its own language. 
you'll find in, in our talk today that some people, they didn't have to preach that much of Islam. But the most attractive thing about them was their human character, was the refinement and development of a human character. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad said, peace be upon him, that the, 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 the thing that will be heaviest, أثقل, the, the heaviest thing on the scale of the believer on the day of accountability is his good character. He said that the closest people to me and the most beloved people to me in my sitting gathering on that day of accountability are those who have the best character. So he's telling Mu'adhi ibn Jabal, therefore, you know, beautify your character because that's the main thing that's going to carry for you. So Mu'adhi, he gets to Yemen, therefore, but he's not staying only in one place in Yemen. In fact, he's moving around different districts of Yemen to maximize his impact as he's calling the people of Yemen to Islam. Right? That's one key example. But Yemen then became important because it became a site of, of travelers, of merchants and of scholars, until today. A site of merchants. So if you think about trade, therefore, it's quite important. Because lands that Islam entered into were important sites of, of commerce, you might say, trade, of merchants. And this is going back all the way to, like, to the silk, silk Roads. You know, from China, from 200 BC, with this amazing network of roads and sites, people could travel around and trade with connecting China to the Mediterranean world, what became the Middle East. So those lands are now Muslim, Islamic lands. Islam is reaching those people. Then commercial centers like Damascus was a major commercial center. But as Muslims are entering those lands as traders, they're settling in those lands, and they're forming settlements, neighborhoods. And it's not just about trading. Trading is like something that opens up a space of conversation, a space of discussion, that people can now communicate and talk about this new faith that they've, they have, and about the Prophet that came from Arabia. What is it that they learn new about life and all these things? And what about the rules, regulations about trade? What about the ethics and moral principles in trading? about not lying and not cheating and not defrauding and no so on and so on. All of these things are part and parcel of that message of Islam as it's coming through with the passing of traders. Persian, uh, early, early Arab and Persian Muslims are traveling from Baghdad, which became a center of influence, all the way to Wangzhou in China as traders, but also as propagators of the faith. So not everybody is a scholar. Some people are just good at, you know, like you guys, wonderful, have their own fields of expertise. Some people are wonderful in science, other people are, can make a lot of money on Amazon, other people try, can never do it, because they can't figure it out. And there's some kind of uh, hidden secrets that no one's telling us, about how to become high and a millionaire, you know, it's a great advert, so not everyone can, can do that. They're just merchants, and that's their skill. But they also have that desire and passion to propagate the message of Islam and they're taking that trade with them and at the same time using the occasion to say something beautiful about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something beautiful about the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Something beautiful about how Islam has impacted upon their life and is having an effect. So communities are coming you know, to the fore in places like Wangzhou, even in China people embracing Islam, but the first impact, the, the first uh, you know, engagement they have with the Muslim is only through trade, not as missionaries going out to places, that comes a bit later, but it was through trade. What about in southwestern India? You have in the uh, coast of uh, Malabar, right? Muslims are going as traders, and then they set up, by the 10th century, you have the community of Seymour, and in Seymour, uh, it's a community of around 10,000 Muslims, but most, many if not most, are Hindu converts to Islam. What are the Hindus finding so appealing about Islam? Well, one of the key things was about social justice. Because, you know, you had the Dalits, and you had other, the laborers, and you have the, in, the untouchables, right? And they saw that as, an, as really an unjust an unjust caste system that they were bound to by fate. And when they saw the way that Islam gives these rights to all sorts of people, 
that there is an Allah in the Quran says, Ya you Hanas, O people, Inna Khalaqanakum min Zakarin wa Unta, we created you from a male and a female. Wajalnakum Shuuban wa Kabat and we made you into nations and tribes, Lita'arifa, so you would recognize and know each other. In Akramakum and Allah at Kakum, the most noble of you in the eyes of God are those who have the most righteousness and piety and goodness in you. Not based upon where you happen to be born or the color of your skin or how tall or short you are. All of these are superficial stuff. Mean nothing in the eyes of God. But it's concerned about you. About you as a person. Right? Your, your, yourself in life, God is concerned about that. And so there was impact therefore. So traveling therefore to places like southwestern India. Uh, and, and then they had other influences. So for example, if you look at even that, like Kashmir for example. How did Islam reach Kashmir? Well, in part because of traders and in part because, you know, influences became Muslim. You had the, the kings, like the king, a Buddhist king called Laha, you know, his name was al Haq Laha, who became Muslim in the 10th century. And he was accompanied by a man called Bulbul, Bulbul Shah. And Bulbul Shah was an Islamic scholar. And together, therefore, Laha, this, this, this uh, Kashmiri Buddhist king who became Muslim is now has him as a patron and is funding these projects about building a huge mosque there in Kashmir and other people are converting because the king became Muslim right so you have social influences at the same time who are impacting upon the growth of this religion and other places at the same time as well so if you look at even in Africa how Islam is Islam getting there trade a lot of it's to do with trade Going as traders, settling there, and then speaking to the people about Islam. Kings of Senegal became Muslim. Kings of Mali became Muslim. Right? Islam reached quickly into the lands of Nigeria and Chad. And these places because of people talking about their faith as they're settling with them in these communities. So therefore, trade is a factor, but not the only factor. What about other things? What about things like intermarrying? Before we get to the main core, what about intermarrying? That has a, has a role, isn't it? If you intermarry, then you know, your kids will become Muslims, and then their kids will become Muslims, and then, you know, as years pass, you have the growth of Islam. That, that can also happen as well, and that also happened. Look at Spain, Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain. In Spain, you had Sara. Sara was the daughter of uh, Alamont. Alamont was a Visigothic king. Now, the Visigoths, if anybody knows about Spain, uh, the Visigoths uh, used to be Aryans. Aryans was the, was the, I wouldn't say church, but the, well, it's not even denomination, but it's, it's, the, it's the way of Christianity of Arius. Arius was the one who was there in the Council of Nicaea with Athanasius, his rival. Athanasius preached Trinity. Arius pre preached a kind of, uh, a kind of, um, what's the word for it? Like Unitarianism. Kind of Unitarian. I mean, he, he, he believed Jesus was not God, that Jesus was a creation of God. Uh, he believed, and therefore, after the debates of Council Nicaea, he was ostracized, and Athanasius won the day. But you'd be surprised to know that at the death of Constantine, he, was, he had a death baptism by an Arian. The next emperor was his son, Constantius I, who was also an Arian. Then the whole empire became Arian. Then you had Julian the Apostate, and they all became apostates. So that's just how it's going. Whoever the king, whoever's in power, uh, the people would adopt that faith. And that's what happened in Christian history. So in Spain, uh, they, the Visigoths defeated the Romans, and they uh, took power in Spain, and they became Arians. So when the Muslims arrived in 711, uh, not too far back, but they were Aryans. And then they went through a conversion to Catholicism because one of the kings became Catholic. Uh, but in their predecessors, they were Aryans. Therefore, when they entered into Al-Andalus, the Muslims of the 11th Arakim and Ziyad, they could recognize something about Islam, about its radical monotheism, about the fact that we say, La ilaha illallah. There is none that deserves worship except one God alone. And nobody with God, not a mediator or a mediatrix, you know, for our Catholic friends, none of that. It's just you and God alone 
who is perfect, perfect in all respects, perfect in wisdom, perfect in love, maximum perfection in love, in closeness, in forgiveness, in mercy, perfect in justice, perfect in all respects. And Allah in the Quran is saying again and again, ma Allah, qalila ma tadhakkaroon. How many times does that come about in, in those verses? My son said nine times. I've got to check. Ma Allah. Is there, is there another deity with God? And Allah keeps repeating the same thing. Ma Allah. Is there another deity with God alone? No. Qalilan ma tadhakkaroon. Little is it that you recount and recollect and remember. Ma Allah. Right? That's, a kind of a, that's the radical monotheism of, of true faith. And so when... Sarah, the son of, uh, what's his name? Who remembers his name? Come on, come on. Let's look at my notes then. <laughs> you know, the son of, uh, the daughter of, uh, I don't know, I think his name was, the Vizigothic noble, right? Uh, when she became Muslim, then she gave rise to a kind of a family dynasty called the Banu Hajjaj and the Banu Maslama. And they remained as Muslims. Remember, the Spaniards became Muslims. How? Through what we call the Mazarids. So by the 8th, 9th century, when Muslims had settled, Cordoba became this glowing beacon of civilization. It became the ornament of the world. That's a reference from Horace Wither. Horace Wither was a nun who never saw Cordoba. But she heard about it. Then she wrote about it and said, it must be the ornament of the world. It was the only lighted city in the world, 10,000 lights, lamp city in the world, not electric lamps, but like you know, candle lamps, lighting the city. Hundreds of mosques and libraries and books and all this stuff is happening there. And the Christians are so impressed by Islam, they began to dress like the Arabs and eat like the Arabs and learn the Arabic language. So Paulus Alvarez, if you read my book, I quote a lot of this stuff there. Alvarez was uh, the the... Uh, he was the main priest of Cordoba, and he was so enraged with the Christians that he said that, how could it be that these young Christian boys, you know, uh, are learning the language of Arabic, and are so skilled and is proficient in Arabic, and if they're asked to write a word of Latin, they struggle. He's concerned about the fact they're finding Islam so impressive. And those Muzarabs, we call them because it's from the Arabic, Mr. Arabin. Those who adopted Arab, Arabness, you might say, in their culture, uh, ended up becoming Muslim at a later stage, right? So people are seeing the rapid rise of Islam. In the Spanish Inquisition, it was, so you had, look, in 1504, five in Granada, you had the great fire of Granada. They burned all Arabic texts, the Catholics who took power. They burned all the Qurans, everything with an Arabic script in it, they burnt it, except the ones that had uh, gold, uh, you know, illumination because that could make money for them. But they burn everything because they, want, they, want, they don't want a semblance of anything Islamic to remain in that country. But there was a fear people are embracing Islam. Right? They're, they're falling in love with the culture of Islam. So these things, of course, are important. So in Tamarij, you also had in Tamarij another example of Spain of the daughter of Theodomer. Now Theodomer is, is because Theodomer was the one that... Uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Nusayr, who was the brother of Musa ibn Nusayr, who was the first person into Al-Andalus, he made a treaty called Treaty of Theodomer. It was to give rights to the Christians to have their churches safeguarded. No one is allowed to despoil a church, to break a crucifix. No one's allowed to upset Christians on days of their festivities. No one's allowed to intrude upon the places of Christians. This is their place of worship. It was giving rights to those people. Now that, of course, was modeled on the treaty that was made by the second caliph, Omar ibn Khattab, with the people of Jerusalem. Right? Protection of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the sight of Christians not to break a crucifix, not to allow people to be offended in any way. The rights and justice of Islam. But his daughter became Muslim. You know, she became Muslim. Uh, she married two Muslim men, in fact, different times. And... Uh, one of them was Abd al-Jabbar uh, al-Khattab, and they became, gave rise to the al-Khattab, Banu Khattab, uh, in, in Spain. So intermarriages of important people also had, an, had a role to play there. Trade had a role to play there, right? What about things like migration? That's a big thing. I remember, of course, in the Prophet's own time, وسلم, he sent his companions first, 
<coughs> to Abyssinia, to Abyssinia, Ethiopia, for them to seek safety and shelter because of that persecution in Mecca. And it was a small group of people, some men, some women, they traveled to Abyssinia. And he said, go to Abyssinia because there is a, there is a, there is a just king in Abyssinia. Right? And they went there seeking protection as migrants in Abyssinia. But that had an effect because it introduced Islam to that new landscape. So the person who carried the call of Islam was a man called Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Allah be pleased with him. And in the court of the Nagus, the king himself, when he asked, what is your religion all about? And he mentioned those verses in the Quran about Mary. وَذْكُرُ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرِيَ إِذِنْ تَبَدَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِيَ مَكَانِ الشَّرْقِيَ Beautiful verses, recount, Allah says, relate to them the, the, the story of Mary when she withdrew herself to an eastern place. Right? Allah goes on to say that uh, in that moment, you know, when she's there, uh, Allah says the, the angel came upon her. Basharan Sawiya, as a handsome man. She says, because she thinks it's an intruder, قالت, I seek refuge with Rahman from you if you have any piety, righteousness in you. I mentioned this in my discussion in Ireland. Why is this verse so key? Because it mentions Rahman. Who knows what Rahman means? Come on, Rahman. Where does it, which, where does it come from, Rahman? Merciful. Merciful. Comes from the word? Rahim. Rahim. Rahma. Rahma. Good. So Rahma, Rahman, Rahim, Rahimun are all derivatives of the word Rahim. Mm -hmm. What does Rahim mean? Womb. It means womb. Right? It means womb. That's the primal origin of the word Rahma. Which means, suggests that Rahmah has a maternal character to it. Maternal character. Rahim. What is a womb? A place of protection, safeguarding, keeping nourishment for that unborn child. And, and Mary therefore says to the angel, she thinks it's an intruder, I seek refuge with Rahman from you, if you have any righteousness in you. She knew herself who was Rahman in her life. Not that as Christians would propose later on that the one she would give birth to is a source of mercy for the world. No. He already exists and has already existed. And that is only and ever God alone himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the engagement of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib with the Nagus. Nagus himself became Muslim as well in secret. And the Prophet of Allah prayed a funeral prayer for him because the, the king himself of Abyssinia became Muslim because of what he saw of Islam. Then you also had the migration. You also had people like the Prophet sent a man called Mus'ab ibn Umair who was young, like 17, 18 year old. And he sent him to Yathrib, which became Medina, to call the people of Yathrib to Islam. But if you think about social influences, that here we have Mus'ab, who himself is kind of a social influence because he's so well known, respected, the most handsome boy in Medina, or in, sorry, in, in Mecca, right? Well funded by his family, but when he embraced Islam, he gets cut off by his family. Cut off. You know, once the Prophet sitting with his companions and he says that, look, look over there, there you'll see Musab ibn Umar. He said, I saw him, this boy, with his family. How his mother and father doted over him, funded him, financed him, protected him, sheltered him. But when he became Muslim, they threw him out. Now all he has on his body are two garments held together by straw. So if you think of a person like who's wearing maybe like designer clothes in those times, at that standard, two garments hardly covering his body, held together by straw. I mean, it was reduced to poverty because of his sacrifice for Allah, for Islam. But he himself was quite a social influence because he was so well respected. But he goes to Medina. And who does he speak to? A man called Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, one of the heads of the Aus tribe in Medina, in Yathrib, who was a major, major player. And he spends time with him, but when he became Muslim, then everybody else became Muslim. And it can have that effect. If one important person becomes Muslim, it can influence others to also become Muslim. 
because they, they value that person's decision, they value that person's integrity and decision making and so on and so forth. They, they can't have an effect like that. In fact, even in, in Kashmir, things like that happen. And other places as well. You know, people of influence became Muslim and then other people followed them in that, in that path. So migrations, therefore, had their important effect. Um, we also have, therefore, migrations of Muslims to that new territory of Spain, of Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain. And they're traveling from Syria, these are Syrian emigrants going there to Spain. But they're transforming that society, as I mentioned already, and creating what we call the convivencia, which means the coexistence. That means Muslims, Jews, and Christians are living together and creating this amazing society of civilization. Of, math, of mathematicians and artists and astronomers and, and scholars and translators and even women like Valada, manuscript illuminators and poetesses, all these things are happening in that landscape of Qurtuba and, and, and Al-Andalus, right? But that immigration is purposeful also because of what they're conveying the message of Islam, speaking to their neighbors about Islam, showing the people the miracle, the beauty of the Quran, of that book of Allah. Remember the Quran came after the previous dispensations of the uh, revelation to Jesus. And it is, and it is divine wisdom of course, that because Christians fell into so many disputes and so many, so many differences and deviations and sects and heresies and fights over heresies and there was no agreement on, it, on any big things Allah would send a new prophet to bring those people back to that radical monotheism of belief in the one God alone. Right? That's how Allah does things in human history with, with prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, migrations therefore to, to, to Spain were also important at that time. Um, in our current world, I mean, even if you think about the world we're living in now, uh, you see... Uh, okay, so migrations, I mean, to, the, to America were really impactful. Migrations to the U.S. Because you had conversions of Latino people. And Latinos becoming Muslim was a big thing because it's in their culture. If one Latino becomes Muslim, it's likely that lots of people from the family of Latinos will become Muslim. So you have great stories of whole Latino families who embraced Islam when one of their members embraced Islam because of that influence and the trust and so on and so forth. When I was so, I was, when I was, when I was so young, I'm still young actually, but when I was much younger, younger, comparative superlative, isn't it? Younger. Uh, uh, you know, when I was just like in, I don't know, very small. But I, one of the first conversion stories I ever heard, and that came in the paper, newspaper, uh, was a story of a girl who embraced Islam somewhere in the north, and then 30 members of our family became Muslim. Like three zero. You know, grandmother, grandfather, nephews and nieces and lots of people. And it's quite beautiful because sometimes we get used to like the status quo. We're just, we're just used to seeing life as we always think it is. But you see this beautiful thing play out that when people become Muslim, uh, you know, it's beautiful because it's a struggle, of course, for those who embrace Islam because sometimes their families are, are concerned about what's just happened right now. But when they see the, the change in behavior of those people, right? I mean, the level of respect Islam is telling us to give our mothers and fathers is found nowhere else. In the Quran, when Allah tells us to worship Him alone, what's the next verse going to be? And show the best of excellence to your parents. Right after Allah is telling us to worship only Him alone, next one is always your parents. Your parents. In fact, the man once came to Muslim in Medina. He came from Mecca as an immigrant to Medina. And he migrated in the burning heat of Arabia, gets there, and he says, Oh Prophet of Allah, I've come to pledge my allegiance to you. And he said, Prophet of Allah, I just I left my parents and they were crying. You know, when I came to you, they were crying back in Makkah. What did the Prophet tell him to do? He said, go back to your parents and go and make them laugh the way you made them cry. Meaning, 
we don't need you right now, go back to Mecca and go and make your mom and dad laugh the way you made them cry. And that was a prophetic character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what so impressed people about him and his life. You know, that's, that's how he was. But the Prophet of Allah says that your heaven is under your mother's feet. You know, like I kiss my mother's feet. I'm sure you guys all kiss your mother's feet. I hope you guys kiss your mother's feet. Do you kiss your mother's feet? Yeah? Yes? Come on, it's no embarrassment to say it. Yeah. No, but if you but you should. Well, you should. You should kiss your parents' feet. So I, I, I do that and my mother kinda of pulls her foot away and says, No, no, no. I have to tell her that this is where my heaven is. If my heaven is there, <laughs> I have a right then to kiss it. You know? But that's so powerful in the religion of Islam that you get that. You know, so when people embrace Islam, the parents see that notable change in them. Allah in the Quran says, if you have parents who are polytheists, disbelievers, rejectors of that faith, don't obey them in that decision about rejecting faith. Don't obey them in polytheism. But still, live with them with beauty. Live with them with beautiful companionship. That you can never neglect your mother, even if your mother is a pagan. Still, Allah is saying, Observe all the rights of goodness and manners and love and devotion you know, to your mother and you know, to your father as well. So therefore, uh, we've been through things like trade, we've been through things like migration uh, and intermarriage. And also you have things like personality. So therefore, Musa ibn Marik to Sa'd ibn Mu'adh in the city of Yathrib, which later became Medina. The Prophet sends also letters to people of influence and letters to the kings of Abyssinia, of the kings of Persia, the king of the, the main players in Yamama, in the Arabian Peninsula, to Alexandria, sending letters to key major players like politicians, kings, in other lands because if they embrace Islam it would have a big impact on other people. And in our current world today we have similar people and have had similar people. When Malcolm X embraced Islam, meaning the real Islam, not the nation, but the real Islam, and he left the nation of Islam and he goes to the Hajj, the pilgrimage, what did he write in his autobiography? He said, for the first time what I saw in the pilgrimage in Mecca, of people of all ethnicity, and all shades of human color, and complexion, and differences, and heights, and all things, are all in the same place, all calling upon the one true God. He said, I saw at that moment that the ills of my society, the racism entrenched in my people in America, can be solved by the great beauty and justice of Islam. And he writes about that. And it's there in his autobiography. But that impacted upon his heart. And he became therefore, uh, thereafter a true Muslim. Accepting belief in Allah and accepting the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. But that had a big effect because, I don't know how you can count the numbers, but just imagine how many people have embraced Islam since. And if you ask them, so I was inspired by Malcolm X. You know, I read the, the or even, I even watched the movie Malcolm X, so that can impact people. Or I read his book of Malcolm X, that in, impact inspired me to become Muslim. Right? So people like Muhammad Ali is another one. Same kind of time period, same kind of struggles. But Muhammad Ali, you know, he wasn't a, a person who was preaching all the time, although he, he does say some interesting things. I mean, he wasn't a preacher of Islam. But his character, you know, his charity, all of his good works, they kind of had an impact upon people. That if, if that's what you're finding purpose in through your faith, then that's meaningful. In our world, we have nihilism. We have purposelessness in our world today. People don't have direction or purpose. Everything is about, you know, your social, uh, well, social media is one thing, but also things like, um, you know, people have adaptation. You adapt, you, you know, to social norms, and these are these are manipulated through media and social media. So therefore, sometimes it's hard for people to fit into society because the, the bar is so high and they can't reach it. You know, 
Think about the whole element of compare and despair. Compare and despair. Instagram, Snapchat. Compare and despair. Right? Do you take your own picture? You, you're wishing for all those likes to come your way. And they do. But then your, your friend down the road has more likes than you. You're going to compare and you're going to despair. And you think to yourself, ah, I'll try harder next time. And then you can you stage your whole room and everything else and you, your life takes over. It leads to mental illnesses. Now you didn't decide that role for yourself. But it's been put out there. And because the bar is raised like that, well, this is what success and happiness means. That means I can't be happy until I get that. I've got to get it. In this pseudo-reality of, <laughs> pseudo-world of, of, uh, of images and ticks and likes and these fake people that you don't even know their names, but they're there with fake names, all this stuff. And that becomes a life for people. This becomes life. They become paranoid and this is what my life must mean. Does life really mean that? Allah the Quran is telling us, your purpose in life is to know the one that created you. To love and revere and devote your life to the one that created you. And then only in that will your heart find happiness. The Prophet Muhammad said, upon me peace, Man kanat al-akhirah hammahu, whoever makes his biggest concern in this life, the concern of the next life, Allah placed his richness and wealth in his heart. And Allah organizes his affair in this life. But if you place the biggest concern of this life in your heart, Allah places poverty between your eyes. Always worrying about, about your money, your money, your money. All happiness is in those money things and it creates a culture of envy, dissatisfaction, comparing and despairing. But if you make your focus on the life to come, which is an everlasting life, an everlasting life of happiness. Then you'll find the greatest happiness in this life, whatever happens to you in life. In Islam, we don't say like, you know, only happy if your life is happy. No. Right? Sometimes you'll find the happiest Muslims to be sometimes even those who are tested in life. The Prophet Muhammad said upon the peace that all of the affairs of the believer are strange. Nothing does Allah decree for him except that it's good for him. And if he's given a blessing and he's grateful, that's good for him. And if he's tested and he's patient, that's also good for him. That nothing afflicts him in this life of fatigue. You know, look at that, fatigue and pain, emotional trauma. Even the pricking of a thorn, except Allah washes away his sins because of it. I mean, you have a law that is loving. You have a law that is ever near to you. You have a law that is kind and appreciative of things that you do in life. That is Allah. That is Allah. Right? So, in examples like these of Muhammad Ali, of Malcolm X, uh, they became major influences in, in the society and it led to great things happening thereafter. But there are, of course, many other things that inspire people about Islam. I was reading this the other day that there's a woman called Evelyn, Evelyn, Co- Evelyn Cobard, her name I think it was. She was an English woman who became Muslim in the early 20th century. And she had a chance to meet the Pope. And in the accounts it says she declares to the Pope that I am a convert to Islam. Yes, it was a way for her just to show I've just converted to Islam. And she says that if people knew about Islam, they would see it as the ultimate solution to all of life's ailments and all of social disturbances. That they would see the solution to be found in the religion of Islam. All right. So many things attract people to Islam. We mentioned therefore about the point about justice. Like when the Hindus, you know, from the Dalits and others, they became Muslim. They saw, well, you know what, this is, this is more fairer Rather than us being the untouchable laborers, outcasts, and people look down upon us as if we're inferior. That can't be a godly, divine dispensation for human beings to live by. They saw justice in that. When the, in the Prophet's lifetime, you had a woman called Sumeya, and her husband called Yasser. And they were the, of the earliest martyrs of Islam. 
But in Sumayya's story, it was that the Arabs, you know, before Islam used to bury their own daughters alive. Because they saw having a girl was a shame. Having a girl was an embarrassment. That was, Arab, that was pre-Islamic Arab culture. One of the earliest verses revealed in the Quran was this verse in Surah Taqweer, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ When the female baby girl is asked on that day, for what crime was she killed? Allah is asking rhetorically, meaning there was no crime. But when she's asked, for what crime were you murdered? There was no crime. One of the earliest verses revealed in the Quran, in Makkah, and when Sumaya came to learn about this, she thought, well, that has to be true. How can we live as brutes, as animals? And she said that I was a lucky one because my sisters were murdered by my father. But my father couldn't, couldn't, get, couldn't do it with me. And hence I lived. And when she realized that's what Islam is telling us, and then it led her to embrace Islam. Bilal. Bilal was a black man. Bilal was the Abyssinian slave, and he was the one who was mocked, ridiculed as a slave. And he was the one that was dragged in the burning sands of Arabia with boulders on his chest. Because when he heard the message of Islam, 